I've been interested in, uh, in drug issues actually since the first class I walked into in college where I, 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 was suggest, I was recommended to take a class called Drugs in Society taught by a Swiss ethnographer. And I walked in, I, I remember it vividly because I just started, first time I had been in cafeterias where you could get all you could eat. So I stuffed a bunch of fruit in my bag before I left the cafeteria, which was promptly squished by the 13 books I had in the bag to take to the class. Um, so all my books from that class, which I still have, are, are soaked in banana. The, uh, the class talked about um, drug issues and in particular sort of issues that, that, that really tapped into something in me that got me inspired to work on this topic, which I've been involved in for almost 30 years. And that, that was uh, the restrictions on syringe access that led to the HIV explosions among people who inject drugs. Um, so that was really my, my intro into this issue. But I'm going to go back even further than that, and we'll start with 1890. So this is a, a, an obituary about a, a, a young woman, 23 years old, um, who uh, was the daughter of a well-known hardware merchant and was found dead in bed. Uh, she, when she was 17, she broke her shoulder and got some morphine to ease the pain and became addicted to the use of morphine. Her form was almost a skeleton, and uh, her, she had puncture marks from shoulder to wrist by the points of a syringe, for the fatal drug had been injected into her system. So if you look at this story, it's not, frankly, so different from the stories we've heard about over the last 10 years in the midst of the opioid crisis. So this isn't entirely new. We've had, uh, uh, we've had issues and concerns with opioids for, for, for some time. The beginning of real prohibition and the sort of the drug war as we know it was really in 1914 with the Harrison Narcotics Act. And that act was, interestingly, it was actually just a tax act. It required any dispensing of, of opium or cocaine, both of which were legally termed narcotics. So I'm not sure how cocaine is a narcotic, but legally it is. Um, and these products had, you had to purchase a tax bill, which kind of got you registered in order to uh, dispense these products. So that really started to restrict the use of the products. And then there was one small phrase in this law, which said, addiction is not a disease. And based on that, the courts interpreted it that doctors could not use medications to treat addiction. So all of the people who were being maintained by a physician on morphine for, uh, for really for what we'd call today an opioid use disorder um, or, any, or, or other drugs for a substance use disorder had to be stopped. And the doctors became criminals and by the mid 20s, there was nothing left in terms of treating addiction in the medical community. And because addiction had been defined as not a disease, the treatment of addiction largely, almost entirely, left the hands, left the medical community. And it was fascinating because it was those, a very small phrase, actually the phrase was because addiction was not a disease were the exact words. Um, we lost the ability to treat addiction for a long, long time. Now, in the 1960s, uh, there were some uh, fan fantastic uh, physicians, uh, Marie Neiswinder uh, being one of them, who started providing methadone for addiction treatment. And I think you've had, you've probably heard a little bit about this, but of course, methadone is is an opioid agonist, so it's a an op it's an opioid that's long acting that happens to work quite well to help people. Um, who have an opioid use disorder to uh, not use illicit opioids, get their life together, and results in a vast number of improvements for people with this disorder. The, the use of methadone, however, came under a, a different purview because addiction was not a disease, because you can't use these products based on court decisions to treat uh, an, an addiction. These programs got their own very unique legal situation where um, 
methadone became by far, in a way, the most tightly regulated product in our pharmacopoeia. Methadone has to be provided through specialized clinics, and these clinics are extremely tightly regulated. The rules are almost entirely controlled at the federal level, and the process of getting a methadone clinic established is very challenged, is very challenging, not just by the regulatory issues, but by the NIMBY issues. And the, uh, and the people who go to a methadone clinic, you know, they have to go and stand in line with a bunch of other people who have an opioid use disorder and maybe other substance use disorders. So it actually can be challenging to, to not use other drugs when you're in a methadone clinic because you're around a lot of other people who use a lot of drugs. So it's, it can be a really challenging environment sometimes, especially for people who really don't want that life anymore. So methadone isn't always the, the, the right treatment in that scenario. Now, the issue of overdose, which is really at the heart of the opioid crisis that we're eventually going to get to, um, that, of course, was an issue, but nobody traced it. Overdose is not a reportable disease. Nobody keeps track of overdose like we keep track of HIV or hepatitis C or hepatitis B or chlamydia, gonorrhea, uh, or you know, 150 other reportable diseases. Overdose is not a reportable event, whether fatal or non-fatal. So nobody paid much attention to it. The only attention, I started paying attention to this, to overdose issues in 1995. And I was looking at Drug Enforcement Administration reports, annual reports, and I was seeing that they were talking about the number of people that died from heroin overdose. And they would say uh, there were, there were 3,000 deaths from heroin overdose this year. There were 4,000 deaths last year. What we're doing is working. Give us more money to do more of what we're doing. And then the next year, they would say there were uh, there were there were 2,000 deaths from opioid or 3,000 deaths from opioid overdose last this year. There were uh, there were 1,500 last year. What we we need to do more of what we're doing to get the numbers down. So give us more money to do more of what we're doing. Um, and that was it. That was the only way that these numbers were used. And I always thought. Can we use these numbers to actually do something different? Can we use them to actually gauge how well we're doing in different policies? And then in 1997, there was a, there was a tragedy in a part of the country in Texas, in a part of Texas called Plano. And Plano, Texas is an area of upper middle class white population. So this is where we start to talk about the racism inherent in, in the drug war and in frankly, in the opioid crisis, which is, I think, a really fascinating issue. In this circumstance, these were young kids, sort of 17, 18 years old, who had been using chiva, which was a term for heroin, but they just called it chiva. They didn't realize, in some ways, that it was heroin. And they would use it for a while. They'd develop their use disorder. They'd, their parents would find out, their parents would force them into a treatment program, they'd come out of their treatment program and they'd do what 99% of people who come out of a treatment program do, they would go and get high. They would go and get high with their friends and they would do a couple of things that really created, that really were what I called at the time a, a textbook heroin overdose. They would drink a bunch of alcohol, then they would inject some heroin. So you, you've just depleted, you've just set yourself in a, in a state where you can't really regulate things, you can't really control things, you've already lost a lot of functioning. Um, and, then they in, and then they would inject heroin and um, not necessarily be able to regulate that, and they had no tolerance because they had been in a treatment program, and so they would go out. And their friends would, when they found them, uh, they would panic. They wouldn't call emergency because they don't want to get arrested and they don't want police coming to their house. And so when they figure, eventually they would put the person in a car, drive them to an emergency department, and drop them off outside the emergency department and speed away. And there were about 19 deaths, 19 or 20 deaths in, in, in a year and a half period from that. But what was different about this, because the, the truth was there were a lot of deaths all the time from heroin through the decades. And nobody cared. So what was different in this circumstance? These were upper middle class white kids. So the press was sympathetic. What you saw in newspapers was, you know, this is a horrible, horrible tragedy. 
it's not the kid's fault. It's not the family's fault. It's just a terrible tragedy. What can we do? So um, I, I was working at the uh, place called the Open Society Institute at the time. And uh, we, we managed to get some funding to do a conference on heroin overdose prevention. And uh, it was the first international conference, and that was in 2000. Um, and at that conference, we talked about a few different things. We talked about education. Um, and in terms, of, in terms of prevention, we talked about educating people who use drugs. You know, what are the main risk factors that we've identified? We knew from the, already from the epidemiology that it was periods of abstinence. It was using multiple drugs. Uh, and, um, and, and, you know, and then there are other factors such as the route of administration. Injection's a lot riskier than other routes of administration. Um, and the interventions that we had were, were, were kind of limited. The main interventions that we, that we had, main intervention that we had was, was education. And then potentially working with emergency medical services, trying to establish policies that, so that paramedics, ambulances wouldn't call police immediately, so that, uh, so that you could feel comfortable calling an ambulance and getting medical care instead of getting uh, police response. So those were some of the initial things. And then there was a man named Dan Big in Chicago with the Chicago Recovery Alliance who uh, was providing naloxone to people who, who use drugs in order to reverse overdose. Now, we've all heard a lot about naloxone in the media. Naloxone's an antagonist to opioids. And uh, the idea of providing it to people who use drugs was pretty revolutionary. It was over the counter in Italy since the early 90s. So Italy figured that out a while ago. There were a couple people, um, right around the time that Dan started doing this in 1996, there were a couple people in, uh, in Europe, in the Jersey Islands and in Berlin, who had started on a low level handing out naloxone to people who use drugs. This was very underground. This was, you know, you're providing a prescription drug without a prescription to people who may use it on themselves or may use it on somebody else. So there's lots of potential violations there. Um, but that was one of the ideas. And then the other, uh, the other major idea that we had around, uh, around uh, uh, preventing overdose was uh, safe consumption sites or safe injection facilities. There's about a dozen different terms for this. But this is places where people can go to, uh, to safely uh, use drugs, usually to inject drugs. Uh, the most, the most uh, famous one in this region would be the Insight program in the downtown east side of Vancouver, uh, which opened in uh, the early 2000s and has dramatically lowered overdose mortality in the region while also increasing uh, increasing treatment uptake, uh, and decreasing HIV, hepatitis C, uh, risks and infections, uh, and managing a lot of other medical sequelae of, of substance use. So uh, that, of course, was and still is uh, uh, not yet an option in the United States. And then the, the final intervention that was discussed uh, was, at the time, was heroin treatment programs. So that was programs where people can go in and inject heroin in a controlled setting. And at that point in time, there had been a few programs tested in Switzerland and, uh, and a couple of other countries. I think the Swiss program was the most famous at the time, where people, they, people who failed other, for whom other treatments failed, such as methadone and various other treatments, uh, they, were, they were eligible to enroll in a program where they could go in to a site and inject heroin as many times a day as they needed. And what, what they found was that people would initially, they'd go in, they'd inject heroin like four or five times a day. And while they were in the program, the number of times they injected heroin would decrease to once or twice a day and their, as their lives got in order and as they started to trust that this service was going to be there for them and they didn't have to stress about when they were going to get their next fix. And the programs were extraordinarily effective. That has also remained a barrier in the United States till today. So um, that gets us up to, uh, up to our current crisis. What we've seen over the last 20 years is a really substantial increase in opioid overdose death. So um, overall, we had probably around 4,000 deaths 
um, in the 19, a year in the 1990s. It was increasing in the 90s, but then it really started to pick up in the 2000s. And what we saw in the first 10 years of the 2000s was really just prescription opioid deaths increasing. We didn't see an increase in heroin deaths. We didn't see an increase in fentanyl deaths. So there wasn't a lot of transitioning to fentanyl or her to, to heroin. Fentanyl wasn't really an issue until 2015, 2014, 15. So we'll get to that later. But heroin, you know, we didn't see this big transition to heroin in part because there were so many prescription opioids available. The, the, the line for the increase in uh, prescription opioid deaths mirrored very well the, the line for the increase in prescription opioid prescribing. The first recognition was in 2007 that there was a problem um, by the CDC. That was the first formal recognition. There were researchers in the late 1990s who recognized this as an issue in New England with OxyContin exposure. However, officially on a national scale, it was first recognized in 2007, and we first started seeing interventions to try to address it in 2010, what, I would, what I'll refer to as, as opioid stewardship interventions. So how did we get here? And there's five main things that led to this prescription opioid crisis. The first one is the, is the economy. As we always say, it's the economy, stupid. Um, the second would be, is the emergence of HMOs in the era of the Clinton era healthcare reform. The third was the war on pain within the medical community. The fourth was welfare reform in the Clinton era, the elimination of welfare, where everybody went to work, right? Well, not quite everybody. Um, and then finally, of course, uh, a, a, a necessary and essential component was the pharmaceutical industry. So what was the economy? So the economy, as we all know, you know following the 1980s uh, shifts from a manufacturing to a service economy, what we saw was that swaths of the United States were left behind. They didn't. They, their, their capacity to build the, the, the new economy that was pushed in the Reagan era just didn't exist. And they ended up with, uh, with parts of the country, particularly Appalachia being the, the, the south, sort of the southeast of the country, being, and, and the, and the um, Michigan, Ohio regions, being some of the areas that were hit the hardest by this new economy, the shift away from manufacturing. And what's interesting is when you look at this map and when you look at a map of opioid overdose mortality, there's a lot of parallels there because those areas were, they were left behind by the economy. And if you think about in San Francisco, if you think about certain, like a neighborhood in San Francisco that where people that live there might feel left behind by the economy without any, without economic prospects, what I think about is people who live in single, single room occupancy hotel units, people who live, in, who, who live in marginal housing. Their economic prospects are extraordinarily limited. And, the, and that's, that's the kind of community of sort of marginally housed people. That's a kind of a community that is often affected by a drug crisis, in particular an opioid crisis. When you're left behind and you feel like there is very little um, you have economic trauma and personal trauma to contend with in your life, you're very, it's, it's, a, it's a point where you're very susceptible to, you as a community are very susceptible to, uh, to a drug crisis, and, and in particular an opioid crisis. The next, so, the, so these regions of the country looked a lot like um, marginal housing, marginally housed people in, uh, in, in urban centers except for one thing, they're almost all white, which sets us up for another racial issue in this opioid crisis, which is that it probably couldn't have happened if the pharmaceutical companies hadn't specifically targeted these populations with opioid prescribing, specifically targeted the physicians in these regions of the country if the pharmaceutical companies had instead, for example, targeted physicians working in urban centers of the country, they wouldn't have been able to do it because they would have been increasing prescribing of opioids to African-American populations 
which wouldn't have been acceptable, like per over prescribing to a white population was. All right, welfare reform. So um, everyone who was on welfare went back to work, except for most of them who transitioned to disability. And that's kind of the simple story there. Um, what we saw in, let's say, if we go back to a community in Appalachia where people mine, and as they age in their mining, they get back injuries, and they can't mine, and now they can't access welfare, they end up going to their doctor to access disability. However, there are two things you have to do to access disability, for, a, for a physician to provide disability. The first is you have to have a diagnosis. So your diagnosis is chronic pain. The second is you have to be treated for your diagnosis. And we're gonna get to a moment why opioids ended up being the treatment of choice. The first reason was the simultaneous 90s healthcare reform, which is that HMOs came to cover a huge proportion of the country from not really existing at all to really taking over uh, much of healthcare. And the HMOs said, we don't wanna pay for this complex pain management. It's too expensive. There used to be really comprehensive pain management clinics at, in centers all over the country. They ceased to exist with, a, with the emergence of HMOs and the emergence of opioids, um, of the opioid access that we'll talk about. So, so this physician now in Kentucky who has the patient on disability, that they wanna get on disability for their back pain because they can't mine and there's no other job in town, then the patient's in an HMO, the only thing the HMO will pay for, for pay, to treat this is opioids. So in order to get the patient on disability, the physician has to prescribe them opioids. So that brings us to the war on pain. Um, and this was really initially led by oncologists. So it was our cancer doctors who didn't want patients to suffer at the end of life. And uh, that, of course, is a laudable goal and was a major issue at that time. In the 1970s, in the 19, and even into the 1980s, when a couple of opioids started to emerge, what we had access to for uh, pain management in terms of opioids was really limited. We had we had Percocet or acetaminophen with, with codeine, with, with uh, oxycodone, and we had Vicodin or acetaminophen with hydrocodone. So both of those, that was most of what we had. Those most of the good opioid products that we had for oral consumption. And those products are limited by the acetaminophen, by liver toxicity from, from the acetaminophen or the Tylenol. So you can only take so much. You can only get, you know, 30, 40 milligrams of, of, of an opioid in your system a day without really starting to put your liver at risk. The other things we had, you know, we had, we, had a, we had methadone, we had some methadone and we had a little bit of morphine, but they were really terrible formulations that, were, that did not work very well, were not well tolerated. And then what we really had after that was IV morphine. So basically when you had a patient who had metastatic breast cancer and had terrible bone pain everywhere, they would, suffer on Percocet or Vicodin until they were near the end of life, they'd go on a morphine drip and that would be the end. So we didn't have this ability to manage people for years with terribly painful diseases. We needed good monoformulated opioids that didn't contain acetaminophen. And we needed industry to provide these for us. But industry, um, I happen to sit next to uh, um, a, a project called the Project on uh, Death in America in the 1990s, and, and I, I, I had the opportunity to witness some of these conversations uh, and the debate that went on between the oncologists and palliative care doctor advocates for more opioids and industry. And, the, and what I heard was from the perspective of the physicians, and that was that the industry wouldn't produce these products just for end-of-life pain. It's not, it wasn't a big enough market. They wanted all pain. So the docs said, can we do it for all pain? Is that good? Is it safe? And they used this one article. It's not really an article. It's a letter to the editor. It's about, that was 10 lines long. 
from, uh, that was in the New England Journal of Medicine in, in the 1980s, 1982, I believe. And this article, um, they, they pulled out and, uh, and started providing this article to, to industry to justify, to say, okay, we can prescribe opioids for all pain. This was a, a, a letter to the editor, so it's not a peer-reviewed article. It doesn't have that kind of rigor. It's some, just some numbers that somebody put together. They said they looked at about 11,000 patients who had gotten at least one narcotic, and they only found four cases of well-documented addiction um, among patients who had had no history of addiction before that. Um, and the addiction was only considered major. I'm not sure what a major addiction is as opposed to a minor addiction um, in one instance. Um, and so they concluded from that extraordinarily rigorous study that, uh, that the development of addiction is rare in medical patients with no history of addiction. So thus came OxyContin. This article actually ended up being one of the most extraordinarily heavily cited letters to the editor in all of history. As you can see, these, this is the number of citations. As you can see, it really starts to pick up in the early 90s, but then in 1996, it, it skyrockets. That's OxyContin time. And this is a letter to the editor that, that's cited in journals, journal articles 30 times a year. This is insane. This is really, really impressive. And so what we get to see is opioid prescribing going through the roof. And so we see opioid prescribing go up and up and up and up and up until 2010. In 2010, we have prescription drug monitoring programs. We have people starting to think about opioid prescribing. We start to see opioid prescribing level off and start to slowly decline. These data only go through 2016. But you can see the decline picks up pace a little bit, and it picks up pace more than that after 2016. So let's take another look here. So this chart is going to take you from 1990 through 2014. The top line. Um, is the top solid line is opioid overdose deaths. The lines underneath are various different opioids. The one that I've highlighted in red is heroin overdose deaths. As you can see, and we discussed before, they were flat until 2010 and then started to increase. So summarizing what we've gone through, we had a shift from a manufacturing to a service economy that left swaths of the nation behind and without economic hopes for economic prosperity. And then in the, in, the, in the late 80s, early 1990 and, and 1990s, we had Dilaudid emerge, which is hydromorphone, oral form of hydromorphone, and OxyContin, which is the long-acting oxycodone um, that we've all heard so much about through the years. We had the, uh, the regulatory body for hospitals and medical systems declare that pain is the fifth vital sign. So this, is part, this came with the war on pain. So if we don't treat pain, if somebody reports their pain is more than three on a scale of one to 10, so if I ask you what's your pain right now, and you say, you say, oh, you know, I just bit a chip, so I'm kind of feeling a four. If I don't do something about that in the medical visit, then it's the equivalent of you coming in and we check your blood pressure and you're 220 over 180, and I don't do anything about it. So legally, it's the same thing as um, as what we actually have as objective vital signs. Now, we all know, I, I hope, if you've ever been pinched by somebody else or you've pinched yourself, you realize that pain is a subjective experience. It has a lot to do with the source of it. You know, there's, it's, it's a cognitive process. Pain is not, the pain that we feel that we experience is not actually physical pain. It's how our, the cortex of our brain processes the signal. So it's not the same thing as a blood pressure. It's not the same thing as a heart rate. Those things are, we can really objectively measure. The pain scale that I put up there before was in a, in, in a study, so they suggested that they could get some reliability from this pain scale when they spent extensive effort explaining to people what each number meant. How many people in this room, when they go and they they go to a clinic and the clinic asks, "What's your pain on a scale of one to 10, How many of the how many of you have had that clinician say, "So a one means this, this, this; a two means this," and gone through all ten numbers and really tried to explain what it all means? 
None of you, because that's completely absurd and impossible. So they took this research tool and implemented it and pretended that it's an objective measure and said, we all have to do it. And if we don't respond when somebody comes in and says, yeah, while they're laughing and chatting away, yeah, my pain's a 15 on a scale of 1 to 10. And you know, we don't, we don't put immense effort into that and provide a treatment for it, then we are in legal jeopardy. Um, so that kind of set things up. And then we had uh, state law and board, uh, state, state laws and, and medical boards liberalized opioid prescribing. So doctors weren't allowed to prescribe opioids as much as before, as much as uh, they, they were after this. This was, of course, pushed by the pharmaceutical industry that was trying to produce all these products. As we said, we had HMO uh, enrollment skyrocket and start to, start to really cover most of the country. And uh, so at this point, what we have is a situation where we've got some good monoformulated opioids. We're told we have to treat pain. We, ha are, we have patients who are economically left behind. We no longer have legal restrictions on providing the, the therapy. The insurance won't cover anything else. And then welfare reform comes around, and our, we have to get patients on disability. So now think about it. You've got that patient comes in. They've got a back injury from mining. There's no other job they can get. You gotta, you, they, their pain is an eight, 8 out of 10 all the time. You've got to treat their pain. Insurance won't pay for anything else. So, and to get them on disability, you have to treat their disease. So you've got multiple, you've got a regulatory mandate to provide opioids, basically. You've got a uh, regulatory mandate from, from, from your regulators in terms of treating pain. You've got a, a mandate in terms of getting them on disability. You've got to provide them opioids. The insurance payer won't, won't cover anything else, so you've got to provide them opioids. And pretty soon, once you provide them opioids, the only thing they're going to want is opioids. So we kind of set this up pretty well, didn't we? And then the FDA approved a couple of other opioids in the years that came. Um, this only goes through 2014. I'm actually on a, a committee now for the FDA that, uh, that reviews opioid uh, drug submissions. But, um, and it's, it's a fascinating experience after seeing what's happened through the years. 2007, the CDC recognizes something's going on. 2010 we start to see uh, the policy and practice changes that, I, that I've discussed a little bit and we'll discuss some more. And that's when we start to see prescription opioid deaths level off. They still went up and they've still continued to go up, which I can't entirely understand. But what we really see is the shift to heroin. We start to see people really shifting to heroin at this point. We're gonna get into that. So what happened to, the, to OxyContin? This is always worth a, a, a discussion. I think um, the manufacturers of OxyContin got in a lot of trouble for paying off docs, for, uh, for promoting OxyContin in ways that it was not actually, that were not actually true, for lying and things like that. They paid a, I believe it was a $400 million fine, which was almost a month's revenue. Um, one of the things they did, they had, they had seven poster children for OxyContin in videos that they sent around to, uh, to doctors to try to get doctors to prescribe everybody OxyContin. And uh, these seven poster children for OxyContin were followed up. Somebody followed up with them in 2014 to figure out what happened. Um, two of them were still using OxyContin and felt they were really benefiting from it. Uh, one of them had really struggled with addiction following OxyContin. And was no, no and was no longer using it. One had died from a uh, opioid overdose, and two had died from complications, other complications of opioid use disorder. So, um, you have three that there were, and then there was one additional person who was still using it, uh, or who who felt that it had helped but had stopped after a little while. So three out of seven benefited from their oxycontin. Four out of seven suffered significantly related to the to their oxycontin use. Um, they also had a, uh, a song, a jingle, that went out with their uh, materials, which was, uh, I, I, I couldn't actually find a recording of the jingle, which I, I searched long and hard. I'm sure it's been um, kind of disappeared everywhere on, on, the, on the vast interweb. Um, 
but the, the, the jingle was uh, get in the swing of OxyContin. Um, so, you know, you look at, I, I've, I've looked at this ad, um, OxyContin maker criticized for new it gets you high campaign. And uh, this is, of course, uh, not real. It is, a sa it is satirical. But uh, um, it's not so far off, I think, from where they were at. OK. So we've made it through the prescription opioid crisis. Now we're entering the, area, the era of opioid stewardship and, uh, and, 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 and what happens then. So the CDC, I also happen to sit on the board of the center of the CDC that uh, uh, that's focused on responding to the opioid crisis. And uh, at a recent, at a board meeting last year, they presented this model about how to deal with this issue. So we've got this population of people with untreated pain. Some of it's physical, some of it's psychological. You know, uh, somebody said to me once, a, a colleague of mine, a mentor of mine said, you know, opioids are a, fan are a wonderful solve for the, for the, um, for the physical and, and environmental trauma of, of, of uh, sorry, a solve for a life full of, of personal environmental trauma. Um, it's the dissociative effects of, of opioids that can really make it easier to deal with the pain of life. And you, you know, we can't ignore that. That's something real. And once, pe once somebody has experienced that and, and has relied on that, to take that away can be really problematic. So we've got this population of people with untreated pain. So some of them are going to end up in alternative treatment, so non-opioid treatment. Some are going to end up prescribed opioids. And some are going to end up misusing non-prescribed opioids. This model is vastly oversimplified, but I still think it's useful. Then you've got this proportion of people using prescribed opioids that are going to transition to what they refer to as misuse of prescribed opioids, and then potentially misuse of non-prescribed opioids. Some of these people are going to end up in treatment, and some will, will end up in recovery. Some are going to end up dying from an opioid overdose. So that's their basic model. Um, like I said, oversimplified, but I, I do think it covers a lot. There's four populations that I'm concerned about as we try to reduce opioid prescribing. One is the people who have untreated pain. Two is the people using prescribed opioids. And the other two groups are the people misusing prescribed opioids and those misusing non-prescribed opioids. These are the four groups, basically the four groups who are using opioids already. I'm, I'm concerned about them. Uh, a lot of my research, is, research focuses on them because they're the people that have the potential to suffer or suffer adverse consequences from our efforts to reduce opioid supply. And that's a complex comment because some people really benefit from, uh, from reducing opioids. So the truth is that line from the population with untreated pain to the population in alternative treatment is really tiny. Most people can't get this alternative treatment. So we managed to, a couple years, a few years back, set up a comprehensive non-medication pain management clinic, integrative pain management clinic, um, connected to the Tom Waddell Clinic in the Tenderloin. That clinic is fantastic. The patients who go through that clinic thrive. I've had many of them in my research studies, and they're the ones who say, like, yeah, that clinic far and away managed my pain better than anything I've ever encountered. Um, but what they, and they can get all those services if they go to 15 different places, if they go out to Laguna Honda for 10 minute physical therapy visits every couple of weeks, which they can only do for a couple of months before their physical therapy expires. Like there's all this stuff that they could do, but it's piecemeal, it's at tons of different places. They have to travel all over the city. They have to figure out how to pay for things and, and it's crazy. You know, when you're homeless or marginally housed, getting around the city is a, a big deal. I mean, for me, it's a big deal. If a physical therapist is more than 10 minutes from my home, I'm not going to go. So, and I have the resources to do it. So I can't, I can't expect a lot of my patients who don't have these resources to be able to engage in these treatment options, even if I can get them available and get them paid for. And then the other side of it is the treatment options are going to end soon. So this integrative pain management clinic is paid for out of city funds. 
and uh, is really one of the most fantastic things we've done in responding to the opioid crisis and responding to opioid stewardship. The reality, however, for most people is that that line for untreated pain to get into alternate, to manage it with alternative treatments is really, really small, except for those of us who have a lot of resources. So the CDC came up with these guidelines, oh, sorry, and then the, the population that make it into treatment is really small. We, have a, we do better in San Francisco than a lot of other places, but around the country, that, pop, that population is really small. You probably heard that in a, you know, a lot of the country, you still can't access methadone, you still can't access buprenorphine, you can't access the medications we use to treat opioid use disorder. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, if you can access them, they're just not provided in a way that you'd actually want to access them. I don't know, I don't think my dad with type 2 diabetes would have put up with a methadone clinic to get his insulin. So, um, you know, so it's, uh, even though he never got over his donut habit, he got treated with respect by his doctors and, uh, and provided the care he needed to live, in, live 15 years longer than his dad, even though his sugars never got under control. Um, so we can do the same thing for somebody who has an opioid use disorder, but uh, in much of the country, we do not. Um, so then we had the CDC opioid prescribing guidelines. I actually sat on this committee that made those guidelines as well. Um, I'm, I've done a lot of this work, and uh, I'm usually uh, a, a, a dissenting voice in much of it. Um, so this these guidelines are about shrinking that line. They're about shrinking the line from the population with untreated pain to the population using prescription opioids. These guidelines are really focused on opioid naive patients. They're intended for, to try to get doctors to stop starting people on, stop using opioids as the first line therapy, starting people on opioids and titrating up to really high levels for chronic pain that is probably not a best treated with opioids. I actually agree with that. I don't think that's a bad thing. However, they've been used. Um, we, you know, many of we, we knew this was going to happen. They've been used uh, by by insurance companies and by clinical systems and by regulators to say you have to get everyone off of opioids. So all these people that have been on opioids for 15 years, you have to stop their opioids because it's not appropriate. Or you have to reduce them to this level. You know, they're on 400 milligrams, you got to get them below 50 milligrams. And you have to do that today. Um, so that's how they're being used. So what's going to happen in this model? If we have the same number of people flowing through this model, what's going to happen is that these lines are going to get bigger. We're going to see more people misusing non-prescription opioids and more people who were misusing prescription opioids that can't access them anymore, shifting to non-prescription opioids. And what are the non-prescription opioids out there? They're heroin and they're fentanyl. And that shift it matters, not just because they have to go on the street and use illicit opioids, but also because those opioids are de facto, we know from some data I'll show you later, um, we know that you're more likely to overdose, even if you know what you're using, your likelihood of overdose is higher if you're using, compared to a baseline of, of injecting a prescription opioid, so you're misusing a prescription opioid, you're injecting it. Your risk if you're, if you're injecting heroin of overdose is twice that. And if you're injecting fentanyl is four times that of heroin. So this is even if you know what you're using. So what we see is those lines are gonna get bigger and these lines are gonna get bigger, which is of course what we've seen in the, in the graphs that I showed before. We've seen the heroin mortality escalate and then the fentanyl mortality escalate as fentanyl became available. So these goals of opioid stewardship, the, goal, the goals are really to reduce the supply of opioids, reduce the diversion of opioids, improve the safety of opioids, and with all of that, hopefully reduce the harms of opioids. So um, there's, and they're, they're, the focus has really been on reducing the supply um, I would argue that reducing, I would argue that, you know, the, the, the biggest issue is probably diversion, and I define diversion a little bit differently. I don't like the word because it's really a legal word, so I'll call it sharing your opioids or providing your opioids to somebody else. And I define that a, lo a little bit differently. I, I'd like to ask a question for you all in the audience. Have, have any of you ever provided a, pres a medication prescribed to you to somebody else, like shared your amoxicillin with somebody else or something like that? I have. Anyone else? 
So some people have not shared a prescription medication with anyone else. I, I'm actually surprised by that because um, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty common. You get your, you know, you get prescribed. I have some 600 milligram ibuprofen in my, in my cupboard that I would not flinch to offer to my spouse. Um, the, uh, so, you know, the idea that, that any sharing of opioids is bad is I don't entirely, I, you know, it's, it's, it's just a reality. And I don't think it's um, necessarily uh, always a terrible thing. What I would define as, as a, the problem is sharing of opioids with somebody who is opioid naive or of opioid unknown status. So in other words, providing opioid, like selling opioids to somebody driving through the, your neighborhood in a car. That's a problem because then you then what we're doing is we're expanding the population of people who have an opioid who may suffer from an opioid use disorder. So that's really the issue. And if everyone took the opioids that they were prescribed or only provided or only they and other people who already used opioids used them, then we wouldn't have seen the huge expansion in people with opioid use disorder that we witnessed. Um, it, things would have gotten better because people would have, been, would have been using prescribed opioids instead of heroin or fentanyl. But instead, what we ended up with was, um, the reality was that a lot of the opioids that were prescribed ended up in the hands of people that were opioid naive and subsequently developed an opioid use disorder. That fundamentally was the, the problem and the failure of this grand natural experiment of pre prescribing tons and tons and tons of opioids. Um, some of the efforts to achieve opioid stewardship, however, are really problematic. The Medical Board of California started a, a, a couple of years ago sending out letters. So what they did was they looked up in the Controlled Substance Monitoring Program, the CURES database of all the controlled substances anyone is prescribed in, in or dispensed in, in California, um, they looked up the, those data and match them to opioid overdose death data. And then if, so if you have a patient that died from an opioid overdose and there's evidence that you prescribed them opioids, you got a letter from the medical board um, threatened, saying that you were, uh, oh, actually what the medical board did first was they called the family of the decedent and requested that the family file a complaint against you. Whether or not the family wanted to file a complaint, they proceeded to issue a letter saying you are under investigation um, for this prescribing and the uh, and you had to prescribe you had to provide all medical records within three weeks or pay thousands of dollars in fines a day after that um, what this led to was uh, was a lot of patients a lot of a lot of <laughs> providers um, stopping prescribing altogether and in fact, stopping plans to prescribe buprenorphine to treat opioid use disorder as well. I'll explain a little bit why, um, why this scenario occurred. Um, so one of the things that, that my group does is we do training for providers. We train providers in how to provide academic detailing and how to train other providers in opioid prescribing and managing patients with opioid use disorder. And so we do this all around California. There was a clinic system in San Diego that was that all of its providers were getting wavered to provide buprenorphine. They were all they were going to mandate that everyone do that so that uh, um, so that they could provide that service to all their patients, and uh, that um, they got some and a few of their providers got these letters from the medical board and they aborted that plan because providing this service would mean that they would be treating people with opioid use disorder who are by definition more likely to die from an overdose, which would result in more attention from the medical board, more letters like this, which would cost the health system money because a letter like this runs $30,000 in legal fees just to respond to it. So um, the, the system abandoned plans to treat, to, to actually contribute to managing the crisis. Um, so there are some really terrible things that have happened from, from some of these programs. So going to the patients that I worry about. So patients who are in pain. Um, this, I, 
this is our, our, our pain wheel. It's sort of interventions that you can use to manage chronic pain, when, uh, um, which includes opioids. But there's, there's, a ra there's an array of interventions. Um, there's a couple new ones that have emerged that I don't have on here, but uh, um, kind of gives you an idea that, that there's a lot you can do. And different interventions help for different types of pain. Myself, I, I suffer from a, a mid-thoracic pain when I sleep at night. Uh, the way that I manage it is I do, I do yoga twists. Um, I use yoga. Yoga is good for um, mid thoracic pain. You know, Pilates tends to be good for lower back pain. You have different interventions that are better for different types of pain. We don't have a ton of data on this, but we have some experience. And what you do is you try a bunch of different things. If you have the resources to do it, you try a bunch of different things and you find the thing that helps you manage the pain. Um, and opioids are not the first line or the second line or frankly the third line for most of these pain disorders. Um, so, uh, but making these therapies, these interventions available means getting insurance companies to start paying for them. And that's more expensive than paying for opioids. It's really hard to get insurance companies to pay for things that cost more. Another reason that insurance companies are so off, sometimes reluctant to pay for these types of interventions was because in the 90s, they pulled back on paying for these things because there was more propensity for fraud in these interventions than in medications. For example, if you, go, if you were to go see a therapist who checked three boxes that they did these three things for you, maybe they didn't spend that much time. Maybe they only spent 10 seconds doing three of the things and, and they got paid a lot of money for that. Um, and whereas if you are prescribed a medication, the insurance company can pretty much know with pretty good, sure, pretty good certainty that you got what they paid for. So, um, so there's, there's less of a fraud issue with medication or you know, less of a concern for a fraud issue with medication than there is for these other therapies. Um, so it's hard to get insurance companies to pay for these. And that also, um, you know, one of the things that we've had some success with is getting them to, is to lift some of the prior authorization requirements for uh, some of the non-opioid medication therapies. So that's, we've, we've had some success in that domain. All right, so let's go to a case here. So I'm concerned about patients with opioid use disorders. So, if, so uh, a patient is transferred for your ser to your service, he has HIV, um, he has generalized body pain, he's been treated with a fentanyl patch, uh, morphine, high-dose morphine, and high-dose oxycodone. He's also on two benzodiazepines, um, and three, one antipsychotic and two antidepressants. He's also in a methadone program for uh, opioid use disorder. He injects heroin. Um, and he, he wanted a new provider because uh, the provider wouldn't give him hydromorphone. Dilaudid. Um, he's never had a utox, and, uh, but his viral load is always, always suppressed, so, he's, so he meets the criteria of being a successful and excellent patient in an HIV clinic. So what would you do in this circumstance? This is a tough one, right? Um, so, uh, so in this circumstance, you, in this particular circumstance, you know, maybe this patient hasn't, they, they, they switched providers, so they haven't been to clinic in a while. And um, so they haven't been prescribed opioids in a while. So they come in, I don't prescribe them any opioids, and I try to get them to switch to buprenorphine. You can imagine it's a long haul. So um, in, a in, in a case like this, it takes me about three years to get somebody to switch, to get somebody transitioned to buprenorphine to manage their opioid use disorder, which tends to manage pain, especially this generalized body pain, lower back pain, a lot better than full agonist opioids. You all have heard about buprenorphine. It's a partial agonist. It doesn't fully activate the opioid receptors, but has a lot of activity in opioid kappa receptors. Um, and it is frankly, better for pain than high-dose full agonist opioids. Um, it's not going to work for everybody. Uh, nothing works for everybody. Anyone who tells you that is full of it. Um, but it does work for a lot of people, and this is a perfect example of somebody for whom it works. So a patient like this I, uh, I have taken care of and, uh, a, and gotten transitioned to buprenorphine and had them be, do extremely well and be extremely successful. However, in that three-year period, I woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning every other night thinking that they probably overdosed on heroin because I'm not prescribing them all these opioids and it's my fault. 
Um, and the reality, the reality was with with patients like this that with a patient like this is it was that they that, you know they did start using a lot more heroin and it was a rough period of time. So um, it's a it's a really scary transition. Uh, I never know if I'm doing the right thing, uh, and um, you know if if they if this patient. Uh, had come to me directly, hadn't been, that was still being prescribed the opioids and came to me you know, two weeks later after firing their provider, I would probably keep prescribing them opioids for some period of time. I'd really try to work on their medication regimen, but I'd try to do it in a collaborative way. Um, and I would tr slowly try to get to the same point that, that, that I would otherwise achieve. Um, but it's, a, it's tough. It's not an easy situation. This isn't a safe medication regimen. Um, there's probably this. There's so many opioids here. It's hard to imagine some of them aren't ending up in other people's hands. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it, you know, but the goal is to keep somebody like this engaged in care and to treat the actual diseases that they have, which includes an opioid use disorder, um, without killing them with the treatment that you're giving them. So it's a it's a it's a tricky situation. We're doing some research on patients in the in the uh, San Francisco Health Network, which is the safety net clinics of San Francisco. Um, and uh, one of our studies, we have some preliminary data from. This is a study where we we recruited patients from the clinics who had been prescribed opioids for chronic pain. And uh, some of these patients had been continued on opioids. Some had had their opioids increased over the last five years. Some had been decreased. Some had been some of their opioids had been discontinued altogether. We interviewed them. We so we looked at their charts. Uh, one one set of the one side of the research team looked at their charts and charted all their opioid prescriptions and various other things from their medical charts. The other side of the team met with the patients, and did a historical reconstruction where they reconstructed their illicit substance use over the last five years through this really fancy way where you tie periods of time with events in somebody's life and things like that. So um, then we merged these data sets and we looked to see if, being disc if having your opioid doses changed was associated with increased illicit use. What we found was that increasing or decreasing your opioid dose was not associated with any change in illicit use of opioids. However, discontinued, discontinuing opioids was, was associated with a, a 2.5 increased likelihood of more illicit opioid use, of new or more illicit opioid use. In that population, we had, uh, I think, about 60 people who had never used illicit opioids before who initiated illicit opioid use after losing access to their prescribed opioids. And you know, just to reiterate, the reason this matters is because even if you know what you're using, if you're using heroin, it's riskier than even if you even if you're injecting your prescribed opioids. If you're using heroin, it's riskier than than injecting your prescribed opioids. And if you're using fentanyl, it's way riskier. And what we've seen in San Francisco is almost is a probably about a 60 percent, 60 70 percent of the heroin in San Francisco has been replaced with fentanyl. It is different than what we're seeing on the East Coast. We don't have the uh, fentanyl, um, fentanyl contaminated heroin like they have on the, on the East Coast. Our heroin's black tar and our fentanyl's a white powder. So you can tell which is which. So you, if you buy fentanyl, you know you're injecting fentanyl in general. So it's a little, it's not, whereas on the East Coast, you have no idea what you're, what you're using. So, um, so you, the, more, the overdose mortality is way higher on the East Coast because they don't know what's in the drugs. Um, I'm going to jump a little bit because you've had these, uh, uh, these talks on buprenorphine and medication treatment for opioid use disorder. Um, this slide just reemphasizes that uh, transitioning patients from, from around 1,000 milligrams of morphine um, it, uh, of agonist, uh, of full agonist opioids for chronic pain to sublingual buprenorphine halved pain scores. So it worked pretty well. Um, and then, you know, just uh, going back to my dad, who his diabetes was never well controlled, but he had, uh, he had an ACE inhibitor for, uh, for kidney protection. He had aspirin. He had, a stat, he had a statin for cholesterol. He had all these things. He had all this ancillary treatment for his diabetes to, to lower mortality. And he lived 15 years longer than his dad, who didn't have any of that. 
And likewise, even if we can't get somebody treated for an opioid use disorder or a substance use disorder, we can screen them for, disease, for infections, we can vaccinate them, um, we can do aggressive management at cardiac risk factors, especially if they're a cocaine or a methamphetamine user. Um, we can treat other, we can treat tobacco and alcohol use disorders. Um, we can educate them and provide them with safe injection equipment and naloxone, and we can extend their lives through that kind of a process. Going on another, I'm, I'm gonna, almost gonna wrap up here so I, we can take some questions. Um, another patient here, this is a patient that I, that I would say uh, came in with personal and environmental trauma. So a 46-year-old woman, chronic lower back pain, treated with escalating opioids for 20 years, um, currently on high-dose morphine um, uh, and, uh, and a little bit of Ativan. Lives in public housing. She's been threatened with eviction. She's been incarcerated twice. She's lost two kids to CPS. Um, she doesn't go to physical therapy because it takes 45 minutes to get there, and she has no space in her housing to do any exercises. Um, her urine toxicology always has morphine, but it also has cocaine. She's never had an overdose. But the clinic policy is we don't prescribe opioids to someone who's positive for cocaine. So what do we do with this patient? Um, you know, in many settings now, we have to stop prescribing opioids to this patient. And you have to just kind of out, you just do a quick taper. You taper them off. Now, I would argue that this patient is not just using opioids to treat their chronic pain, their chronic physical pain, but is also using opioids to cope with the fact that their life kind of sucks and they're not happy. And it's hard to make it from day to day. And opioids are giving them, um, they're make, it's making it easier to make it through to tomorrow. Is it the right way to make it easier to make it through to tomorrow? Maybe not, but they've been doing it for 20, they've been doing it this way for 20 years. So changing it is gonna be really hard. And also because changing, because using opioids chronically changes your body and how your body handles things. So taking the opioids away is really, really hard. If you have to take the opioids away, I think, you know, you have to, you have, to argue, you have to argue to do it in a really slow fashion. You have to somehow get pa the patient on board and get the patient engaged with this process. Um, and you have to try to address the other issues that they have. You know, they're being threatened with eviction all the time. They, you know, it's, it, it's possible they sell a little bit of their morphine and that's how they pay their rent. So they're gonna lose their housing and become another homeless person statistic if you just take their opioids away. That doesn't, I don't, I never justify selling opioids so that somebody, prescribing opioids so that somebody can sell them and keep, and pay their rent. I don't, I don't medic, I don't think that's a valid reason to prescribe an opioid. But I do need to recognize that when I take the opioids away, my patients may lose their housing. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a big hit on their health and it's a big hit on, on, you know, um, quality of life. Um, so, you know, so I have to recognize things, even if it's not going to change my practice, I have to recognize that. And maybe we can do something to try to, you know, solidify their housing, find them less expensive housing or something like that before we, um, before we, you know, pull the rug out from under them. It's a really, really hard situation. Confessions of an Opium Eater, great book if, any, if anyone ha, um, is really interested in this issue. I stood at a distance, aloof from the uproar of life. Um, or as Lenny Bruce puts it, I'll die young, but it's like kissing God. So, um, you know, how to reduce opioids when somebody's on opioids and they shouldn't be on opioids or you don't think or they should be on a lower dose. Um, this is, to me right now, this is the golden egg of, man of opioid stewardship. We're trying to figure this out. There are no guidelines. The guideline is you have to have patient engagement, but it's really hard to get a patient to say, yeah, I wanna reduce my opioids. When they do, they reduce their opioids and their pain is so much better and they do fantastically usually. Not always, but usually. Um, so you know, if you have a patient that wants to do this and they're engaged and you work with them closely and you do it carefully and thoughtfully, it can, it can really improve their life. But if you force it on them, it's disastrous. People drop out of care, people overdose, people have, su you have suicide, um, you know, you have really bad situations. So, you know, fundamentally, I think about this crisis, at least the prescription end of it, as, you know, if you think this is iatrogenic, iatrogenic meaning caused by the medical system, then it's like leaving a pair of scissors in, an, in a pelvis 
at surgery. We have, as a medical um, community, an extremely strong ethical requirement to take care of patients that we have harmed with our practices. And we harmed a lot of patients by overprescribing opioids. And taking care of them doesn't mean just taking the opioids away. It means actually taking care of the diseases that we created by overprescribing opioids. Um, yeah. So uh, I think of two different approaches to opioid stewardship. One is really aggressive, um, which is basically the same way we, we expanded opioid prescribing. Um, it's where providers are scared and they want to stop prescribing because they don't want to get the attention of the medical board. Um, they reduce or, or, or they have regulations that say, you know, all, your patient on 1,000 milligrams has to be under 50. You know, honestly, if you have a patient on 1,000 milligrams, you get them down to 600. That's a huge success. But the insurance company, nobody recognizes that as a success because they have to be under some magical number. So, um, you know, changing how we, how we deal with that. Um, abandoning patients, uh, aborting plans to provide addiction care. These are, this is the aggressive way to, to manage uh, our overprescribing issue. Um, the cautious way, you know, is really relying on evidence, getting patients engaged. Um, expanding our non-medication options, and uh, really trying to, struggling to maintain patients in care and, uh, and using our opioid use disorder medications vastly. I'm gonna stop there. I think we have about 18 minutes for questions. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's absolutely a reality. You know, I've had patients who, um, they, I've, patients that I've inherited that are prescribed, um, you know, methadone and oxycodone and their urine is, only ever positive for heroin, cocaine, and methamphetamine. Um, so they're getting prescribed these medications and they're selling them to buy um, drugs in the street that can get them more high. Um, you know, in a situation like that, I, I, I can't really prescribe those medications. I can try to get them onto an opioid use disorder medication. Um, you know, I can get them onto buprenorphine or a methadone program or some other, some other intervention, but I can't keep prescribing those medications. Um, you know, and then usually those patients call me curse words and storm out of my exam room, um, which which is hard because I want to keep patients engaged. But um, I don't win all the time. I think in 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 this situation, if you're if you're winning fifty percent of the time, you're doing a great job. This is really 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 challenging. Um, what's the difference between? Uh, medical use and non-medical use. I'm, that's how I'm going to interpret your question. Uh, so um, medical use is using it to manage some, um, I'll use quote marks, legitimate pain issue. Um, non-medical use is, is using it to get high or have fun in some way. And, but there's a, there's a blend between those because sometimes, um, you know, for most patients who have an opioid use disorder, they're not getting very high. They're mostly getting right. They're mostly fixed, you know, that's why it's called fixing, because um, their body has a has a has a uh, strong dependency on, on opioids. Um, uh, but uh, and then you know some of that is some of that getting high is coping with a life is coping with or escaping from a life that is really hard. Um, I'm going to make an analogy to my dad again. Um, you know he never got his donut habit under control. Um, I'm not going to claim that it, that eating donuts was a was a medical requirement, but it was something his body really wanted to really demanded that he do because that's what you know having type two diabetes. Part of what having type two diabetes is is a craving for 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 sugar because your body's not processing it right, um, and it you know it provided him with some feeling of satisfaction and you know as he aged and struggled with various things that he could get that satisfaction of a donut. Um, it's not medical. It'd be better if he didn't do it, but we can manage, um, we can manage things and we can help him, you know, extend his life, um, through other interventions. 
Yeah, well, it was. Um, I'm not going to claim that HMOs are a problem in terms of in terms of health in terms of healthcare, but the emergence of HMOs in the 1990s helped to. It was part of the problem, and it helped set the stage. And for a couple of reasons, main thing being that opioids emerged at the same time, and opioids, you know, at a thousand bucks a year, were a lot cheaper than these fifteen thousand dollars a year. <laughs> comprehensive pain management clinics. And H, the thing HMOs changed in healthcare is they stopped paying for more expensive stuff and they went for cheaper things. And they also ten, generally shied away from a lot of the non-medication options that were costly and more difficult to regulate. I, you know, ho hopefully healthcare can be part of the solution. I, I mean, the health, the healthcare, the insurers have, um, what they've done is they've they've set rules. So now you can only prescribe patients, you know, under you. So that what they did before was they said the only thing you can use to treat pain is opioids. And now what they're doing is saying you can't use opioids. Or if you're using opioids, you can only use a little bit. Or if you have somebody on high dose opioids, you have to get them below 90 or 60 or 50 milligrams. Um, and you have to do that like basically immediately. And, and you're, and as a doctor, you're gonna have to do prior authorizations every month and put hours of your time every month into trying to get this patient their medication, um, even if you're trying to taper them down. And we're not gonna, and if you get them from 1,000 milligrams to 500 milligrams, we don't care because that's not under our magic number of 50. And um, so, they, so they've, they're trying. They're trying to be part of the solution, but uh, they're not doing it in a nuanced way. It's, it's hard, and I understand, you know, it's hard when you're looking at these numbers and you're going to look at a metric uh, in a whole patient population, especially if you're a huge payer. Um, you're going to look at a metric in a whole patient population. You can't really look at the subtlety. You can't look at it and you can't necessarily see the trend in their opioid prescriptions and say, oh, they've gone from you know 800 to 750 to 720 to 710. They're doing great. I'm not going to bother the provider. I'm just going to let them refill their 700 milligrams this month. Um, you know, they, they can't see that. They can't see that level of subtlety. Um, they're just using these across the board uh, metrics that are misinterpreting the CDC guidelines. Um, so again, trying to be part of the solution and causing some problems along the way. But uh, but we uh, ho hopefully we we you know we've made like I said we've made some adjustments like getting some medications that used to be prior authorization only um, uh, covered without without that step. Uh, for those who don't know, the prior authorization step is uh, something that providers have to do um, that it, that is time consuming. It's basically a way of rationing access to, to, a, to a product. Yeah, well, methadone clinics work really well. Um, there's, you know, as, as you've heard before, there's three options for, um, three main options for medications to treat opioid use disorder. There's uh, naltrexone, buprenorphine, and methadone. Um, very few patients want naltrexone. Um, some, some do, and some do well on it, um, but it's, you know, a, probably a couple percent of the population. Um, buprenorphine, excuse me, is my preferred because I can prescribe it as a general provider, um, and patients can, can get it, pick it up at the pharmacy and be treated just like anyone else with any other disease. Um, methadone is very restricted. It's in clinic settings. Um, sometimes patients do better on methadone, um, and we've had a hard time figuring out who does better on methadone versus who does better on buprenorphine. Um, you know, sometimes people do better on methadone if, for example, um, they, they, part of their disease is like needing some degree of kind of sedation from their medications because you don't get any sedation from buprenorphine. Buprenorphine kind of wakes you up. You know, you can get your stuff done if you're using buprenorphine. If you're using methadone, sometimes, you know, people who can't control their heroin use without getting a really high dose, um, they, uh, you know, they can be sedated a little bit. And it's, it can be hard to look at somebody like that one time and say, wow, methadone's doing great for them. You might look at them and say, methadone's just making them sedated and sleepy and they're not getting anything done. That's horrible, it's terrible. You know, what a terrible medication. Um, but if you, one of the things you learn as you go, one of the things I've learned going through medical practice um, is you have to look at how someone is compared to how they were and when you have somebody whose life is a com 
complete disaster. They can't get housing. They can't get anything done. They're getting arrested every other week. Um, they have, you know, their friends and family have all deserted them. Their, you know, their life is a real train wreck and they get into a methadone program and then they're able to get into, um, housing, a housing unit. Um, and then they're able, you know, they're able to, uh, you know, find some legal sources of income. They're, they're, you know, they're able to make it to their doctor's appointments. They're able to get their diseases under control. They're able to get in touch with their, with their, their kids that they haven't seen in 20 years. Like, you know, that's actually a huge improvement. Um, you know, just like my, you know, to go back to my dad, you know, he, he improved a lot, even though his diabetes never got greatly controlled. But um, the, uh, so, you know, it's hard to look at people once and judge whether or not the intervention's working. But when you follow them over time, we know from, we know from the data and we know from firsthand experience that, um, that, that people really do benefit from methadone. Uh, so in methadone clinics, they're taking it as a orally as a, as a solution. Um, uh, there's no injectable opioid treatment available in the United States. Um, there is in Canada and in probably, I don't know how many other countries, probably at least a dozen other countries. Um, in Canada, for example, you can, uh, you can inject morphine, you can inject uh, dilaudid hydromorphone, um, you, they have, uh, they have some heroin injection. Um, so they, they have, uh, uh, I believe they have heroin injection. I'm not certain. Um, uh, they have, they have those access to those interventions. I have some patients that, um, one that I'm thinking of in particular that I, I you know, I really wish I could offer him injectable hydromorphone, which is Dilaudid, uh, which is kind of the closest thing we have to heroin. That's a pharmaceutical opioid. Um, I think he would do really wonderfully on that because he has not thrived in any other um, interventions. But, yeah. and, and in those situations, they inject themselves, yes. So, so your question was uh, that early on, I, I said, I, in the talk, I said addiction was not a disease. Um, I was quoting the Harrison Narcotics Act, where um, the legislators said that addiction is not a disease. Um, that wasn't physicians. It wasn't the medical system. Legislators said it, and the courts said, okay, addiction is not a disease, so doctors can't treat it. Um, that was really the beginning of the mess that we made of treating substance use disorders in the 20th century. Is it, is it now a disease? Or is it I, I, so um, within the medical community, yes, we consider addiction a disease. And in the last... Um, in the last 30 years, we've seen the emergence of addiction medicine as a field in, in, in medicine. Um, it used to be the only people who really had any, who treated substance use dis disorders at all were psychiatrists. And they, um, and they didn't use medications because, they didn't really use much for medications because they, you know, they're not really allowed to use many of the medications. Um, and what we've seen in the last 30 years is we've seen addiction medicine emerge among family doctors and internal medicine providers um, who have who come from a different perspective. So um, I, as I've as I've expressed uh, several times, I think about an opioid use disorder and substance use disorders very much like I think about type two diabetes. So you have a, you have a genetic predisposition, and there's a genetic predisposition for an opioid use disorder. And you have lifestyle factors or exposures. So, you know, my dad was, I'm going to get diabetes someday, but I'm trying to delay it with lifestyle factors, you know. Um, so, you know, your diet and exercise. And um, if you have, uh, you know, if you know what, an, what an, we, we measure diabetes with an A1C, which is a percentage of red blood cells that have sugar stuck to it. And uh, if you have an A1C that's a little abnormal, you can probably get that under control with some diet and exercise, and you might be able to avoid medications. If your A1C is through the roof, you really got to start medications. So I think about it as, you know, if you have a mild substance use disorder, you might be able to get that under control without medications. If it's through the roof and I don't offer you, at least offer you medications, then I don't consider that reasonable practice. Um, so this concept of, uh, of managing addiction as a medical disease, um, it's, you know, it's 
it, it started re-emerging in the 60s when methadone became available, um, and it's really taken off in the last 20 years. And part of that takeoff, part of that advancement, frankly, has been because the opioid crisis affected huge swaths of white America. And so people cared about it. And if you look back at the history, I, we, I, we, I didn't go through really the history of these drug crises, but you know, a drug crisis, it, when it's, um, it's very rare that, that it's affected, um, that it's been like this one has been. Um, generally, it's been about you know, um, the, the Chinese and opium or the uh, African Americans and crack. Um, you know, generally, it's about a minority group or Mexicans and, and cannabis. Um, it's about a minority group and racism and going after a group in order to push them down and using criminal justice to, uh, to attack it. What we've seen in this circumstance is using the healthcare system to address the opioid crisis. Um, and I, you know, I hate to, I, I hate to use the word opportunity, but it, we do have a, an opportunity right now with this tr huge tragedy to try to build a system where we respond to substance use like we respond to other chronic diseases and with public health tools and medical tools. Um, so, yeah, there's been a lot of progress. So we have, we have good medications to treat opioid use disorder. We have good medications for tobacco use disorder. We have some good medications for alcohol use disorder. You know, things are imperfect, but we're getting there. Um, we, we don't have medications yet for stimulant use disorders. That's a big element of my own research is looking for those medications for methamphetamine, cocaine. Um, we've had some, we've had some successes, but we've got a long way to go for in, in that domain. Um, so yeah, I think we've made, uh, we've made huge steps. There's still a lot of stigma and there's still a lot, uh, you know, and that stigma is, is driven in part by the legal issues. You know, if donuts were illegal, my dad would have really struggled a lot more. <laughs> yeah, so it's, you know, it's, it's fascinating. Sometimes um, it, when, when a patient comes in, you can feel that, you can feel a pressure to, to address, you know, you, uh, I think Dr. Steiger, who spoke here, um, he, would, he, he gives fantastic talks on this, um, you know, about a patient who's sent to him um, because they're on a little bit of, of uh, hydrocodone, of Vicodin, um, and the doctor doesn't want to prescribe them that anymore. Uh, and, uh, and the patient comes to him and, you know, the patients, he, he'll talk to them and say, you know, and the patient will say, yeah, you know, I mean, I, that doesn't matter. It's, but, you know, I drink a lot and I wish I didn't drink so much. And so he'll actually, he'll ignore the hydrocodone, let it go, and he'll address the alcohol use. Um, and starting using medications, we have approved medications and we have a lot of off-label options for alcohol use disorder. But most people with an alcohol use disorder, they don't know that there's medications that can help. They're not even aware of that. I mean, it's startling the number of patients that I see um, in, in inpatient settings who have no idea that there's you know, a dozen medications that we can pull out of our quiver that might help them. And we, you gotta try multiple medications, you know, like high blood pressure. Sometimes, you know, a patient doesn't respond to the first three medications you try and you find the right one. It's the same thing with a substance use disorder. We might not have the right medication, but we got a bunch that we can try. Um, sometimes adherence can be a bigger issue. I have to wrap this up. I wanna say thank you all. Um, I appreciate the questions. It was great. I'm happy to stay here if there's any more questions after this. Um, but thanks for being here tonight and for, uh, um, I hope you didn't miss too much of the game. Thank <laughs> you.